afternoon, everyone. As you may have guessed, uh, this is the uh, Sally and Ralph Duchin campus lecture series in Judaic studies. It's a series that's been made possible by the generosity of Sally and Ralph Duchin of blessed memory. Um, my name is David Graysboard. I'm from uh, the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies. And I'm happy to introduce my colleague, Tom Kovach, who today will be uh, speaking to us regarding his own decades long professional and really personal journey in the study of German Jewish culture. Um, as I've discussed with Tom, this is kind of a bittersweet uh, event for us because in a sense it marks his uh, well-earned transition into the status of a retired professor, but uh, at least a retired professor in Judaic studies, but he tells me not to worry because he's going to stay put in Tucson and, he, and we will hear from him again in the future. Um, as at least some of you know from our promotional material, Professor Kovach joined the University of Arizona in 2004. Uh, 94. Oh, oh, 94. Okay, so that was my mistake. Sorry, 94. And he did that uh, partly in order to assume the directorship of the Department of German Studies. And really, uh, as long as I've been here, which is already 20, 21, 22 years, uh, he has been an active and treasured member of the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies. Of course, Tom, you were a member before, before my time here. Um, Kovach is the author of numerous works on the literary contributions of major German Jewish writers, such as Hugo von Hofmannsthal and the more famous Rainer Maria Wilke. Uh, Rainer um, Maria one one, Wilke. Correct, one yeah. quick correction, Wilke is not German, uh, not Jewish at all. No. Um, uh, yeah, I, I did. I say. Um, yeah, sorry, that's okay. No, I, I, did I say German Jewish? I meant major German writers. There we go. Okay, uh, that's what I wrote anyway in my notes. Okay. Uh, so much of Kovacs's more recent work delves into the participation of Jews in late nineteenth century and early twentieth century Austrian and German literature. He has also written extensively on the writing and cultural import of German writers who have grappled with the troubled history of relations between Germans and German Jews. Professor Kovacs's most recent book, to give you a sense of that, that particular focus of his endeavors, is entitled The Burden of the Past, Martin Walser on German Identity. And that is a book that reflects on the post-war uh, author, uh, Martin Walser, and his own struggles to grapple with the burden that the Holocaust represents for uh, Germany and Germans today. Uh, Professor Kovacs will speak for about 45 minutes, and uh, that's, you know, give or take, and then I will read your, uh, your questions and comments. Please enter them in the Q&A section of the uh, Zoom room. Um, my thanks to Fernanda Charles and our other student workers for making arrangements for this talk. Thanks also to uh, Martha Castleberry, our business manager for supervising just about everything we do here at Judaic Studies. Thanks especially to you, our audience, for being here. Uh, so with that, I, I welcome you, Tom, and uh, give you the floor. Thank you very much, David. Appreciate your introduction. And I just want to say I so much wish that I could be seeing you in person today, but as we all know, these are not normal times and uh, we are doing the best we can to, to uh, compensate. So I'd like to begin today by really talking about my personal history a little bit, because, um, you know, this is in many ways a very personal subject for me. Starting with my parents, uh, they were both born in what was then the Habsburg monarchy in uh, 1912, just a couple of years before the World War I, which uh, created an end to that monarchy. My uh, mother was born and raised in Budapest. My father was born and raised in Vienna, so he was German speaking. Well, they were both German speaking actually. But uh, my father had a lot of his family also from what was then Temeshvar in Hungary, what's now Timisoara in Romania. So, you know, they had a very complicated and rich uh, cultural background in that respect. Um, my father, who, uh, as I say, was raised and educated in Vienna, uh, studied uh, engineering, 
and in the 1930s, I believe it was 36, took a job with an uncle in, in Budapest. Fortunately, he was in Budapest um, and did not have to live through the so-called Anschluss or the Austrian annex, the German annexation of Austria. Um, so he was in Budapest where he met my mother, where they got married. And at this time, this is in the late 1930s, all the Jews in Budapest believed they were safe. They did not have to worry about anything. We all know how wrong they were about that. But fortunately, my father had the wisdom to say we really need to emigrate. And in 1939, they did cross over Europe. And I remember them telling me the story when I think they were in France, they met a German Jew who uh, was returning to Germany and said, oh, I can't believe all this terrible stuff they're saying. Just one of the many stories that sort of convey how, you know, how, what a crazy time it was. Um, so they made it to uh, cross the ocean. My father had, was very successful as an engineer. And, um, just a little bit about their background. Neither of them came from a very religious family. I think my father had no religious connections at all. My mother had some, but uh, I did not have any religious upbringing at all. Uh, really, growing up, my only source of Jewish identity was knowing that my mother's father, who, was a very, who had been a very distinguished Budapest attorney, was a victim of the Holocaust. And that fact kind of weighed on me. And then just thinking about my childhood, I remember one incident when I was in elementary school, where um, this anti Semitic bully came up to me, pushed me and said, Are you a Jew? And my response was No, I'm not. And um, until then, I had really understood the term Jew to mean a religious a member of a religious community. And so I really didn't think I was lying when I said, no, I'm not. On the other hand, as I grew older, I became more acquainted with various kinds of uh, kind of, uh, you know, sort of tokens of Jewish culture, like uh, Jewish humor in particular. I remember some of you of my age group might remember the, uh, the album by Alan Sherman, My Son, the Folk Singer which is really sort of mocking all these folk songs in very kind of Yiddish inflected Jewish ways. And this really brought me to be able to understand Jewishness as an ethnic and cultural identity, not just as a religious one. And although my parents, as I say, were raised in very assimilated families, I did hear a little bit of Yiddish growing up. I remember the word meshuga, meshugana uh, quite a bit. And, um, you know, this also you know, kind of contributed to my expanded understanding of what Jewishness really could mean. And this really kind of led to some reflection later on about how we define our identities. And this is something I'll be getting back to later on. And then jumping ahead, and this is really now just focusing on my Jewish history, it was not until my first academic position of all places at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City that I became involved in a Jewish religious community. And uh, some of you may know the joke here that, um, as you may know, uh, for in the Mormon church, uh, non-Mormons are regarded as Gentiles. And so the joke is, of course, that uh, Utah is the only place in the world where a Jew is a Gentile. But um, in any case, uh, I was really part, of, very involved in the religious life there. And after 12 years in Utah, I took a job as a department head at the Department of German and Russian in, believe it or not, the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. And um, here I continued my involvement in religious uh, life. I was actually charged with leading the musical sort of ensemble in the uh, high holiday services in this very small congregation in Tuscaloosa. So just a little bit of a snapshot of my Jewish background. As to my German 
background, you might say. Um, German, as I said, was my father's native language. And, you know, of course, because he was someone born and raised in Vienna, though, um, you know, as I mentioned already, much, much of his family came from Temeshvar in Hungary. My mother, on the other hand, was born and raised in Budapest. But as you may know, it was quite uh, common among this sort of upper middle class Jewish families in Budapest for German to be their, their primary culture. And so, you know, they spoke a lot of German. They had a German maid um, helping to raise them. And later on, now looking into my early years, my mother took a job first at Tufts University teaching German and then at a community college near Boston. And she made a brief attempt to teach my brother and me a little bit of German, but it never got very far. But my main source of German culture was my immersion in classical music, which remains the great passion of my life. And in particular, it was uh, listening to German leader, Schubert leader in particular, sung by Dietrich Fischer Dieskau that really brought me to me coming familiar with the German language and the sound of German, which you know I just had all these very positive connotations with. And uh, I didn't really have the option to study German in junior high or high school. But then as an undergraduate at Columbia in the late 60s and early 70s, I did start studying German. And I ended up choosing German as my major. Why, you may ask? Well, there were several teachers who really inspired me and uh, especially the writers they were teaching, um, Franz Kafka in particular and Thomas Mann. Um, two of those teachers, by the way, were Jewish, which I didn't know at the time, but learned later. Um, so, you know, this also kind of continued my involvement in German studies. I went on in postgraduate years to study, to seek a doctorate in comparative literature, uh, but I chose, of course, German as my major emphasis. And then, um, but now jumping forward quite a few years to 1994, when I first arrived here in Tucson to head the German studies department at Arizona, that um, I first became involved in Judaic studies as well. Uh, this is thank, thanks in large part to the outreach of our now deceased colleague, Leonard Dinnerstein, who was a great, uh, great uh, model for me. And uh, this really has shaped my career in some very fundamental ways. But it also sort of made me, you know, aware of the fact that the whole idea of German Jewish studies was something a little bit uh, dicey, you might say. And one little anecdote I think serves to illustrate how that might be. Uh, very early on in my time as department head in 1996, I invited uh, Jeffrey Peck to give a guest lecture. He was uh, the author of a really leading study on the revival of Jewish life in Germany. And um, he gave a lecture on that topic. And then afterwards, when uh, there were questions, there was one elderly gentleman in the audience who uh, apparently wanted to ask a question, but in fact, he actually launched into a kind of rant, talking, addressing both of us, saying that any Jew who would be in German studies is a traitor to his people. And now this may come as a surprise to you, but you know, especially for that older generation, it was not totally unusual to have people think that how could any Jew be in German studies? And so, you know, obviously this is um, a kind of lingering concern, although, you know, there is much wider acceptance in these days of this field of study. So, you know, I just wanted to give some of those anecdotes as background. And we have one more anecdote I think I might throw in here, which also reflects on sort of the German mindset. And this is now going back to the early 1970s when I had finished my undergraduate years and I got a fellowship to study at the Goethe Institute near Munich in the summer. 
And, uh, you know, this is also a funny in kind of reflection on the state of language studies back then. Uh, back then, it was, it was really not about learning to speak a language. It was all about start reading the literature. They would cram all of German grammar down our throats in one semester, and then it would all be reading the literature and speaking about it in English, of course. So that was how I was educated. But then in this summer, I, you know, did brush up my German speaking skills. And I never forget this one little occasion where I bumped into a, a, a German native speaker and you know, got into a conversation. And as you may know, any European who meets an American who speaks their language is quite astonished. Um, and so this, this woman asked me, so, you know, are you, you know, where are your parents from? And I said, oh yeah, they, they emigrated from Europe in 1939. And, you know, as soon as I said that date, you know, this person said, oh, and, you know, right away, I could tell what that was all about, that she realized, oh, my God, I am talking to a Jewish person here. And this is not that there was any hostility. It was that in this period of time, uh, the Jewish population in Germany was so tiny that, uh, you know, most Germans, you know, of, let's say my age group had really hardly ever, if ever, met anyone Jewish. And so, you know, this is another piece of the puzzle here. But now I want to jump ahead to my time, you know, collaborating with Jewish Judaic studies here at Arizona. And I want to talk in particular about the two classes that I've taught in that uh, context. One is um, the class on German Jewish writers. And I'd like to talk about that one a little bit. This started around the year 1700, going up to the present day. And when this is a general education course, so this is not a course for students who are majoring in German or necessarily even students who are in Judaic studies either. You know, a lot of them just were doing it to get their gen ed credits. But I would always begin the class by telling students I know that when you hear the words German and Jewish next to each other, you probably only think of one thing. And we all know what that one thing is. It is the Holocaust. And, um, but then, you know, what I try to confront them with is, you know, this may seem unbelievable to you, but for about 150 years from the late 18th century until the rise of Hitler and the Nazis, there was no culture in the world where Jews felt more at home, where they felt more that they were, you know, part of that culture and could participate in that culture. And, you know, so part of the question, part of the challenge in this class, and really more in general, is how could that be? How could, you know, on the one hand, you see this kind of interplay between these two cultures, and on the other hand, this horrendous calamity? Well, no easy answer to that question, obviously. But I think, you know, just to map out a little bit of what I cover in that class, I do, you know, want to uh, emphasize some of the huge names, like in literature, Heinrich Heine, some of you may know as one of the great German writers of the 19th century, and Franz Kafka, who most of you do know, of the 20th century. And then in classical music, uh, Felix Mendelssohn and Gustav Mahler and several others. But then just in terms of uh, you know, his, uh, some of the great thinkers who really shaped modern um, psychology and modern thinking in many ways, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, Albert Einstein. And, you know, this I just remember now, one other thing that I have to say right away, uh, when you hear names like Karl Marx or even Felix Mendelssohn, you say, well, Jewish, really? Because of course, uh, Felix Mendelssohn's father had had him baptized as a young child. And we all know that Karl Marx was not a great fan of uh, religion of any kind and was uh, not at all uh, anxious to kind of uh, to promote his Jewish 
identity. But on the other hand, what's important to understand is that these people were viewed as Jews in their culture. And uh, this really brings us to a question that I'll be dealing with again in a while, and that is, how is identity defined? I mean, is it something that we choose or is it something that others impose on us? And this is one of the major questions. But getting back to German Jewish writers, uh, the first, uh, the only writer we look at who's actually not technically a German writer because she wrote her memoir in, in, in Yiddish was a Glückel Hamon. This, she's from the 1600s. Um, but what's interesting in reading her memoir is that she portrays this world in which Jews were still totally looked at as outsiders and in which the Jewish community looked at itself as a totally outside community. But um, at the same time, she reflects on how, um, how these Jews are learning to acculturate to a great degree, degree learning German, learning French, and how you know the Gentiles are just so flabbergasted by this. It's just a very funny anecdote she tells about how her, you know, these uh, people who borrowed some money from her father and had no intention of paying it back are talking about that in French. Uh, but then, of course, uh, her sister uh, knows French very well and reports to her father who manages to thwart these people's attempt to uh, screw them over. So that's just one little thing. A more major figure is Moses Mendelssohn, the grandfather of the composer Felix Mendelssohn, who was a really pivotal figure, not only in German Jewish history, but in Jewish history and philosophy, because he really was one of the great, you know, sort of philosophical figures of the time. Um, and he was a great contributor to the German Enlightenment movement. And uh, most of his writings really were not related to religion. Um, but he was really renowned in that he, on the one hand, he, you might say he led a double existence. At home, he was very Orthodox Jewish. But then out on the streets, he collaborated with these Gentile German philosophers and was really a leading person in that circle. Um, and, you know, this, you know, the, his example was really a huge one for especially the Jewish community who said, oh, my God, you know, we can be a part of German culture. Um, and at that point, and still retain our Jewish religious identity. But then things got a little complicated. And this is a pattern we see over and over again in German Jewish history that you get a great positive breakthrough and then it's followed by something very negative. In this case, what happens is, of course, the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. You see France, of course, granting <clears throat> rights of citizenship to the Jewish population. And then Napoleon's army is basically imposing French law on a good part of the German speaking world. And uh, as you could imagine, this led to a great deal of resentment. And the uh, Jews are partly the target of that resentment. And so you, this, you might say this is a key moment in forming German identity. Of course, Germany didn't exist then. It was just a number of German speaking states. But um, Germans were really uh, taught that, uh, you know, to be German means to be Christian, also to be male. It was a very, very misogynist kind of uh, movement. But this really led to an upsurge in anti-Semitic uh, feelings. And so, you know, you, the question is, how did the Jews respond to this? You had a whole generation of Jews who inspired by Moses Mendelssohn, felt, oh my God, we can enter into German culture. But then you might say the door slammed in their face and they were caught in this no man's land. And of course, what was the solution for them? Well, the obvious solution for most of them was baptism. Heinrich Heine was very famous for the aphorism. The, the baptismal certificate is the ticket of admission to European culture. And uh, alas, that uh, was true for so many. 
just to, to take a very striking example of Moses Mendelssohn's six children, four of them decided they had to get baptized. One of them was, of course, Felix Mendelssohn's father. Uh, uh, and uh, his father, father um, also was, uh, wrote a very revealing letter showing that, you know, on the one hand, he wanted to kind of distance himself from his very traditional Jewish upbringing. But on the other hand, although he claimed to be a Christian, he clearly felt some resentment towards the Christian world as well. So you see, you know, really several generations of people now with this very conflicted sense of identity. And this is really an ongoing question. Um, and uh, then uh, what are some of the other um, things to be said here? Um, so now we jump ahead to around 1867 in, in Austria, 1871 in Germany, where Jews are finally achieving citizenship. Uh, and in, of course, 1871 in Germany is the, now we finally have a Germany that is uh, under Prussian rule, there is a united Germany. Uh, and so you might say, well, this is another great breakthrough time, but then wouldn't you know it, in 1873, there's a huge economic crisis. Um, and then of course, with all these people suffering from the economic woes uh, in those situations, people always look for scapegoats. And what scapegoat could they find? Well, of course, the Jews, who were, of course, long associated with shady financial practices. And um, so this is the situation that Jews face as they approach the turn of the century. There's a wonderful novel by Arthur Schnitzler that I always used in my German Jewish writers class called The Road into the Open, which maps out the various ways that Jews had of kind of uh, coping with the rise in anti-Semitism. And there's a vast range, you know, on the one hand, you have the Zionists. On the other hand, you have self-hating Jews who want to totally erase their Jewish identity. There's a wonderful little passage where uh, these, this uh, very Jewish family, which is basically uh, so supported by their wealthy uh, grandfather, who is uh, a Jewish merchant and uh, who's very Jewish and likes to be very aggressively Jewish, but then his, uh, his children, his daughters who like to have the salon where they invite all these upper-class Gentiles and artists, and they want to, of course, downplay their Jewishness. But then, uh, so the old guy is there and he's having this very kind of uh, uh, aggressive conversation with one of the young ones who doesn't want to be Jewish. And he says, oh, well, I, I guess you must be baptized. And he says, no, I'm not baptized, but to be sure I'm not Jewish either. I have long been without a creed for the simple reason that I have never felt like a Jew. And then here's the response that I find. So kind of both comic and sad. Well, if someone knocks your hat off once on the Ringstrasse, because you have with your permission, a rather Jewish nose, you will feel hit like a Jew, you can rely on it. And to me, this is one of these great little moments where, uh, you know, it sort of, in a very aggressive way, confronts you with the fact that maybe you can't decide if you're Jewish or not. And then, of course, you know, just to take us through one more good news followed by bad news uh, phase, in uh, Post-World War I, where the, you have the first German democracy, the Weimar Republic, Jews achieved an unprecedented uh, level of you know, status in the German world and contributed hugely to all professions and all cultural spheres and even in the political world. And here's something I think is worth noting uh, you know, for people who reflexively think that, oh yeah, Germans have always been these terrible anti-Semites, unlike us. Uh, well, in the 1920s, anyone who knows American history back then knows there's no way in the world that any Jew would have been a Secretary of State. But actually, the Weimar Republic, the first foreign minister, the equivalent to Secretary of State, was uh, Walter Rathenau. Now, 
admittedly, he was not a religious Jew, but clearly he was recognized as Jewish or seen as Jewish. Uh, and then, of course, he was assassinated in 1924, so that was not a very happy ending. And once again, we, as we all know, in the 19, late 1920s, we saw the huge depression. And once again, we see a rise of anti-Semitism in its wake. And in Germany, we see, of course, the rise of Hitler and Nazism. So we all know what followed after that. And now the question is, how, you know, what is, what is life like after the Holocaust? And um, one interesting fact, and this, this gets to the title of my talk here, um, the famous German Jewish intellectual Hannah Arendt in the post-Holocaust era coined the term negative symbiosis. So yeah, I hadn't mentioned this earlier, in the early century, the uh, German Jews coined this very optimistic term, German Jewish symbiosis. Those of you who know the biological term know it means that you have two organisms who feed on each other in a very productive way. And so the notion was these German and Jewish cultures which come together are really mutually beneficial. But then in the wake of the Holocaust, there's this notion of negative symbiosis which means on the one hand that, well, Germans and Jews are the two cultures or two peoples in the world whose identities are really defined by the Holocaust. But they're defined, of course, in totally different ways, either as perpetrators or as victims. And so, you know, it's hard to find any kind of humanity, any kind of mutuality, you know, in this, there's a schism that cannot be bridged. Um, on the other hand, one thing that's uh, interesting to note about post-war German history is that uh, Germans tried very hard to uh, really atone for the sins, for the crimes of the Holocaust. They uh, you know, paid huge uh, reparations to uh, the survivors and to the, the uh, relatives of victims. And uh, they really made it absolutely illegal to, you know, indulge in any kind of anti-Semitic um, sp speech. But, you know, although there were only small, relatively small numbers of Jews returning to Vienna or to, I'm sorry, not to Vienna, to G the German world, um, it was a very tiny number compared to what had been over 200,000 Jews before uh, Hitler's rise to power, what was now in the probably 10,000 or so in the early 50s. But even for those few, they were facing huge disapproval from the Jewish community worldwide, you know, looking at them saying, how could you do this? You know? And um, this, you know, when we read this uh, generation of Jewish writers coming to age in the 1950s or so, they were groping with this. They were, you know, their parents were totally conflicted. Um, there, there's this phrase of sitting on packed suitcases to describe, you know, their, you know, their sort of the kind of way they would talk to their children, saying, "No, we're not really here. We're just this is just temporary." But of course, uh, one of the German Jewish writers says, "Yeah, they were still sitting on those packed suitcases twenty years later." Um, so. You know, the fact is that the Jewish life did exist in post-war Germany. And um, then um, what is then, of course, very striking is with the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, you have this huge influx of Jews from the Soviet Union. And uh, of course, what was the most welcoming place in Europe for them? It was Germany. And so you had a huge increase in the Jewish population. Um, their numbers are very hard to map these days. It's definitely over 100,000. Some would say it's 200,000 or more. And also it depends on how you define Jewish identity. But um, in the 1990s, by any measure, uh, Germany had the world's fastest growing Jewish population. One of the many ironies of the new situation is that you know, earlier in the 19th century, especially uh, 
the German Jews who were trying so hard to assimilate and to be regarded as German looked at their the Ostjuden or their Eastern European neighbors and you know very disapprovingly and because uh, you know when you had a lot of these emigres from Eastern Europe as you did in the late 19th century they helped to sort of smudge the the image of Jews for the German Jews and so these German Jews would say oh they're too Jewish that was one of their phrases but then jumping ahead to the 1950s I'm sorry 1990s we have this influx of Jews from the former Soviet Union who had absolutely no religious upbringing because it was the Soviet Union. And uh, so the German Jews now look at them and say, they are not Jewish enough. <laughs> One of the many ironies of history here. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a picture of the German Jewish writers class. Just to want to talk very briefly about the other class I taught which is about how Jews are represented in German texts through the ages. Needless to say, this is not as happy a topic as the German Jewish writers. Um, yes, of course, many of these from going way back to around 1600 are very, very anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish as might be the more appropriate term back then. But uh, German culture, of course, is not unique in that regard. You could find similar examples in virtually any European culture. And um, it's also uh, contains writers like the German Enlightenment author, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, who in some of his most famous works really strove to combat and refute anti-Semitic stereotypes. And um, he really took Moses Mendelssohn as his, as his model. So just to begin to summarize a little bit, um, the whole question of Jewish life in the post-war and the post-Holocaust era, you know, really leads to these questions of identity that I raised before, but I think they're really worth thinking about. For these Jews, and you find this, you know, these, point, these questions that are raised in a lot of the writings of the contemporary generation of Jewish writers in Germany, are they German? Are they Russian? Are they Jewish? Are they all of the above? You know, what is their identity? And this is something they're all struggling with. Um, and it's an ongoing question. Um, and, um, you know, just and one more fact, by the way, is that, uh, yes, you know, certainly in recent years, we've seen some incidents of anti-Semitic rhetoric and even violence in Germany, but we've seen that all over Europe. So it's nothing exclusive to Germany. And it remains the case that Jews in Germany, I think, are better protected <clears throat> than in almost any other European culture because of German laws that were enacted. And because Germans, you know, I think still instinctively feel it's in their interest to be regard to really be able to put the Nazi past behind them and not be associated with it. So, um, you know, this is an ongoing thing. Um, but, you know, as is true all over Europe, um, the state of Jewish communities is still a little fragile. And, um, you know, is it possible to think of a normal time? And that term keeps getting uh, evoked a lot by German Jewish writers, you know, going back to the 1990s, when will things be normal? Well, you know, in our world today, you know, we can ask the same question, will anything ever be normal, you know, between uh, COVID and Ukraine, you know, nothing seems very normal these days. But um, I think there are reasons to be hopeful about the future of Jews in the German speaking world. And I really do, you know, like to end my classes with that notion. But then, you know, let me just turn finally to some general reflections on German Jewish studies. And to me, some of the really interesting parts of it are the complexities of Jewish identity. And then on the other side, how Jews are represented by non-Jewish Germans. And, you know, these, I think these two questions tie into larger issues that are not exclusive to Germans or Jews, 
but to human beings in general. And one is that whole question of identity. And, you know, to repeat this question, how do we define, how is identity defined? First of all, is it defined by race, by religion, by ethnicity, by nationality, by gender, by sexual orientation, you know, and the list could go on and on and on. What is identity? How do we understand it? And then, of course, the other question that I raised before is, who determines this identity? Is it people themselves or is it those on the outside? And you might say, okay, so for instance, that passage from Schnitzer that I read earlier does evoke this stereotype of Jews having funny noses, but we all know that's not true of all Jews. And uh, there is no one clear way of discerning who's Jewish by their appearance. On the other hand, if we're talking about racial identity, uh, that's a little, although even, so, even in that term, you know, some people's identity is a little more mixed and that can be a little liquid, but still it's a more easily recognizable identity. And then the question is, you know, then, you know, who gets to decide that? Um, there was a politician, by the way, whose name I can't remember, who uh, was sort of became a, a little um, notorious for having claimed Native American identity. And then it was revealed that she really was not Native American at all. So, you know, even in these kinds of identities, we see a lot of these conflicts. And then the other side of it is, you know, the other class I taught is how Jews are represented. And this kind of more theoretical term that is used here is representing the other. And what is that all about? It is all about, I think, a human tendency to want to project our fears, our, our loathing, our hostilities onto some other group. And unfortunately, this is an ongoing reality for human beings. Um, and um, the fact, you know, so, you know, is there anything positive to be said here? Um, I don't see that the human race has been cured of this tendency, but I do then, you know, returning finally to a look at the Jewish community in Germany today, the fact that there is a Jewish community in Germany and that it is really quite thriving in many respects, I think is a hopeful sign for the future. So let me stop there and see if you have any questions or thoughts. I don't hear you. Sorry, uh, thank you, Tom, for those stimulating thoughts. I see that we have uh, three uh, entries in the Q&A section. Uh, Professor Beth Nakai says, hi, Tom, great to see you, it's been too long. Uh, um, another attendee asks, the question that comes to my head is whether there is a story of achievement and assuming prerogative uh, within society and culture that is an ongoing thing and whether this is like a story of, quote, religion. I'm not sure about the achievement and prerogative part of that. Could you perhaps flesh that out a little bit more? Or uh, I, I'm simply reading the, the, the question, perhaps the the person who posed the question would care to clarify. Um, if, if I may interpret the question, I think it's trying to uh, see if you would distinguish between a story of religion or a story of achievement. Okay. Um, well, it is okay. It's let me let me begin by admitting, of course, I have downplayed the religious element quite a bit here, and there's more to be said there. By the way, I mean one of the ironies is that um, uh, you can think of the major major groups in modern Judaism, Reform Judaism, as you may know, is something that clearly had its origins in Germany. Um, even modern Orthodoxy, neo Orthodoxy had um, roots in Germany. So, and I think some would even say conservative Judaism had some roots. So yeah, I mean, 
you could certainly uh, focus more on the religious aspect and talk about how you know religious Ju Judaism as a religion was really fostered in the German-speaking world. Clearly, I've spoken. I've chosen to focus more on the secular aspects of Jewishness, but I think uh, the religious aspects are certainly worth looking at as well. Okay. Um, again, if uh, the questioner wishes to clarify, I invite him or her to do so in the Q and A section. There's another uh, another uh, question here, which actually, uh, in a way, anticipates my own uh, quote. How does Zionism fit in, in the ways Jews have been perceived by German Gentiles, in the ways that Jews in Germany regard their brethren? So. Well, that's a very good question. I mean, Zionism is this very complicated phenomenon, and you may know a little bit about Theodor Herzl, the Viennese Jew, who was the founder of the modern Zionist movement. Ironically, he was growing up this very dapper young man who everyone looked at as, you know, oh boy, he's really one of the sexy guys around there, and who was, you might say, the epitome of assimilation. Um, and this is one of the great ironies of history, that uh, yes, he was, uh, he actually was, uh, was actually well known for his writing, and he was a jur successful journalist for the Vienna paper. And um, so he, yes, he was thoroughly German, but then interestingly enough, he was sent as a correspondent to Paris in the, 19, uh, in the 1890s during the uh, Dreyfus affair. And although there's controversy as to whether that was what really turned the scales for him, I think clearly it was some influence on him and made him realize that uh, maybe uh, assimilation is not going to be the solution for the Jews. But then ironically, he came up with a couple of very assimilationist uh, sort of ideas for how to solve the problem. One was, and this is part of Viennese culture dueling, that uh, one prominent uh, a Jewish fellow would uh, challenge one of the prominent anti-Semites to a duel. And then he would win, and then of course uh, this would defeat anti-Semitism, which we can at this point ro roll our eyes and say, "What did he really think that?" And then another is, and this is even more mind-boggling, that he had this notion of a mass conversion of the Jews to Catholicism, and where the Pope would come to Vienna and sort of greet all these Jewish converts in his open arms. Uh, so, yes, uh, so even Herzl was not easily drawn into the Zionist idea, but then he finally realized that this was the only way, and he wrote his treatise on the Jewish state right around the turn of the century. And, um, but then, of course, these Jews really struggled with it. He was very hopeful that he would, he would uh, persuade his fellow assimilated Jews to join the movement, but of course, as we know, uh, there was a great resistance um, among you know, in France, Germany, and Austria. But in Eastern Europe, of course, the Jews very much rose to this challenge. Um, so, but I mean, for the German and Austrian Jews, Zionism for many of them was a real threat because, you know, for many of them, they said, oh, for years we've been saying, we are Germans, we are part of this nation. And now we have Jews are saying, no, we are not. We are part of a separate nation. So there was a lot of, you know, a lot of kind of tension within the Jewish community about Zionism. Yeah. Very good. Uh, another attendee asks the following. With Germany's high culture in music, literature, philosophy, etc., and Jewish acceptance and integration into society, how do you understand why the Jews were betrayed by their fellow citizens through Hitler's actions? How was this culture impacted by what, what, what Hitler asked Germans to believe and do? To what extent did German culture embrace this? Well, yes, this is one of the very difficult questions. Um, you know, the easy answer is the huge economic, well, it's not just the economic crisis, it's the defeat of Germany in World War I. Because, you know, Germany had only recently achieved status as a major power in Europe. You know, after years of Germans dreaming of German nationhood, 
they finally got it, then uh, things were looking up for them. And they really thought, oh my God, after all these centuries of France and Spain and England, you know, being the great powers of the European world, we are now taking the hard turn. Uh, but then of course, World War I came along and the Germans were totally, totally uh, kind of humiliated by their demise in the war. And then add to it the, uh, the economic crisis. And so, you know, whatever, you know, kind of allegiance Germans had felt towards Jews and towards the acceptance of Jews into their community, most of them, you know, most of it was gone. And again, there's this kind of scapegoating as always happens. And, you know, then of course, another aspect of it is denial. Um, you know, Germans didn't really want to, to fully accept what was going on. I mean, even during the years of the Holocaust, most Germans chose to look the other way. They chose not to really think about or what or know what was happening. And of course, any Germans who lived in big cities would have probably seen Jews getting uh, rounded up and taken away. But, um, you know, it was not a very comfortable fact for them, so they chose to ignore it. Um, so, I mean, this is a question that, you know, you could go on and on and on talking about, but there's no easy answer. Okay. I have a few questions of my own, but I, I see that uh, an, the uh, uh, attendee who asked the earlier question about achievement versus religion has chosen to try to clarify. Oh, okay, uh, sure. This person writes the following. Something like a God lays back of all social and technological or organization of peoples who succeed by adopting prescribed norms and values, the religious part. I don't know, does that help, Tom? I, I guess I'm still having a hard time understanding at least um, what, what the question is. And I'm yes, sorry. So, so am I, I'm sorry. Uh, so perhaps in, in communications after the talk, we can clarify. Um, let me pose a couple of questions uh, that uh, come, I think, uh, logically to my mind, at least, um, in response to your mention of uh, Hannah Arendt's uh, uh, framing of German-Jewish relations in terms of a negative symbiosis. As you uh, know, and I think we have probably discussed, um, for his part, uh, Gershom Scholem um, wrote of a, quote, one-sided love affair between German Jews and German culture. Mm -hmm. Now, I personally see that definition as, as perhaps uh, granting a, a lesser force, lesser determining force to the Holocaust. But uh, do I hear you correctly to be arguing for a more nuanced uh, picture that takes into account into account the ebbs and flows of the relationship rather than characterizing it as simple as one you know monotone kind of yeah reality yeah I, I definitely would agree with your your assessment there that yeah I think that I guess it's been part of my my personal challenge to really to argue for this notion that you know the German Jewish relationship is not entirely negative and has not always been negative. And yes, it's true that of course, Germans bought into Jewish culture. I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, Jews bought into German culture and wanted to be part of it. And it's not as if the, Jew, the Germans wanted to be part of Jewish culture, but it was not entirely negative. It was, uh, you know, there were Germans who were sympathetic to Jews who really, you know, saw them as part of the world and wanted to, part of their community and wanted to defend them. I mean, you know, I already mentioned the example of Gotthold, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, but he was not alone in this respect. And so, you know, I, I just would oppose a very, very one-sided view. Um, yeah, I know Gershom Scholem, you know, he certainly had his reasons to feel that way, but I think there. I think there are. There, it's a more complex picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you remind me parenthetically of a conversation I had recently with our colleague uh, Ruth von Bernuth, 
uh, she's an early modernist, and she was telling me a various, a stuck scholar of Yiddish, early modern Yiddish, and she was telling me a various instances in which uh, Yiddishisms uh, entered the, the German, the modern German lexicon, mm -hmm. even some Hebraisms. But I, I, I want to ask the, another question, um, and that really follows from the question you were asked earlier about Zionism. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that for Heine, Heinrich Heine, the baptismal certificate was an entry ticket into European civilization, at least, you know, enlightened civilization. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if in your study of contemporary Germany, you have found that anti-Zionism is a sort of entry ticket for entry into, for Jews to enter uh, into a progressive, polite society. In other words, the wow. rejection, the explicit rejection of the predominant form of uh, national political Jewish expression. Yeah, okay, this brings us to very complex issues here. Yeah, I think anti-Zionism, and I see this worldwide, is in a way a kind of a ticket of admission, especially to left-wing political culture these days. You know, another of the historical ironies that where in the past we associated anti-Semitism with right-wing movements, you know, you could say these days it's the left wing that's most anti-Semitic, although even there, I think there are complexities. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it is true that, yeah, some of the, some of the Jewish, uh, German Jewish writers of the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, felt very, they have to disassociate themselves with, with Zionism. And, you know, this is, even before the 67 war, uh, you know, there were Jews who just did not want to because it was, again, they were claiming to be Europeans and Zionism means, hey, Jews are not Europeans, they are their own nation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is a lot of complexity regarding that as well. And by the way, you brought up the example of Yiddish, which I think is also something and one more anecdote I like to share is, as you all know, I think Yidd Yiddish is a German dialect, and this is one of the kind of uh, signs of this kind of interweaving of these two cultures. But a little anecdote I want to mention is a colleague of mine, also Jew in German studies, uh, is married to a um, German woman. And um, they were living in New York at the time, and uh, his... Uh, grandparents were coming to visit who were very Yiddish speaking. They, uh, you know, had no other, they, well, they spoke English, but mainly Yiddish. And then he, uh, his, um, his uh, parents-in-law were visiting from Germany. And so one evening he brought them all together, his grandparents and his parents-in-law, and they were speaking to each other. Uh, the grandparents in German, the parents-in-law, I mean, the grandparents in Yiddish, parents-in-law in German, and they understood each other reasonably well. But then uh, when he was driving his uh, parents-in-law back to their hotel, they turned to him and said in German, well, that was a funny kind of German they were speaking. I always love that story, you know, which is, you know, it shows on the one hand, the, the closeness, and on the other hand, the farness the the kind of alien nature right right sort of mutual intelligibility and unintelligibility that's yeah, interesting yeah um so uh, uh the the attendee who asked you the earlier question about uh, german culture asked a, a rather you know a rather pointed question as a follow-up um she writes and i think this i don't know i don't want to i don't want to assign intentions to her but it seems to me like almost like a uh, like an outraged uh, um, rhetorical question. Quote, so high culture and its teachings did not make Germans more moral? End quote. Well, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, you know, does high culture make any of us moral? I mean, that's, is that, that's, that's a good, I mean, yeah, that's a question of how we define culture for one thing. I mean, and, you know, here, I guess I'm inclined to think, well, okay, uh, let's think of uh, great artists like Richard Wagner or, uh, you know, poets uh, like Ezra Pound. Uh, 
who, as we know, both were pathological anti-Semites. Uh, so, you know, does high culture definitely necessarily involve a higher moral standard? And I, I guess I'd say not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, does German high culture, did it lead any Germans to be more understanding, more accepting of uh, Jews and others? For some, I would say yes, but certainly that wasn't the solution for mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, we are uh, technically at an end. It's exactly five o'clock, at least according to my computer here. So, I'm um, I'm going to uh, to close this uh, this affair, but also tell people that uh, you may certainly uh, get in touch with uh, Judaic Studies and with Professor Kovac if uh, we can be of any uh, help in answering your questions about these very interesting matters of identity, culture, and possible uh, symbiosis between cultures. At any rate, thank you very much, Tom, for, uh, for uh, your, your insights, and thank you all for being here. I'm happy to report that uh, this worked without technical difficulties, <laughs> um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in our next events. Uh, tomorrow, we will have the Pleven uh, uh, the yearly Pleven talk on modern Israel studies with Professor Ken Stein that will be uh, streamed live, uh, but is also being held in person uh, here at, excuse me, not, not here at the university, but rather at the Tucson JCC on River at Dodge. So uh, we look forward to seeing at least some of you there and certainly to uh, knowing that you're there at least electronically. After uh, Professor Stein's talk, uh, by the end of um, April, we will have a conference on anti-Semitism in which both Professor Kovach and I will participate. More information on that later. So for now, thank you all very much. Thank you, Tom, and uh, we shall be in touch. Great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.